on this episode of China Uncensored, when terrorist becomes propaganda. Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. If you've been watching this show, you've heard about Xinjiang in western China. It's home to the Uyghur ethnic minority, where more than a million people, and by some estimates, three million people, have been put into re-education camps and forced to violate their religion and their children put into orphanages. So to learn more, I went down to Washington, D.C. to speak with Nuri Turkel. He's a Uyghur lawyer and human rights activist. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. So what is life like for Uyghurs in Xinjiang? It, I, it must be pretty safe. I hear there's lots of Chinese police around. It is very safe. Um, probably the safest place in entire China, maybe uh, entire world. The Chinese government is pouring in with the mindset of making Uyghurs feel safe to build lots of uh, uh, security apparatus. The streets are full of cameras. The Chinese government wants to make sure that your phone is not hacked, so they run it through data scan. And, and they, they force you to do that. Yeah, and they wanted to take your DNA samples to make sure that you don't have any terminal illness. Yeah, what is up with that DNA sampling? There are di different ways of uh, uh, explaining uh, the Chinese motive. Uh, one uh, is they wanted to establish a... Um, uh, database uh, for this new system that they're building up to monitor their, its citizens. And the second uh, possible reason is that they wanted to uh, engage in some bioengineering in the future. Like create a super Uyghur? Super Uyghur, maybe uh, uh, European looking, uh, ethnically Chinese looking Uyghur who appreciates this universally accepted Chinese culture, uh, speak Chinese, talk like a Chinese, act like a Chinese, think like a Chinese. Wait, seriously? Is that something they're trying, they can do with DNA? I, I think that scientifically that's possible. That's absurd. And, and Chinese are very capable when it comes to that kind of technological advantages. Well, when you don't have a, a state that's answerable to the people, you can get a lot of science done. The Chinese government have invested uh, a substantial of money in the recent development and in addition to taking advantage of American and European uh, inventions by forcing uh, companies doing business to share business intelligence uh, and, and the uh, uh, technological inventions. Mm -hmm. The second reason is the Chinese government has been using the technological advantages and resources that they have to uh, uh, increase their state security apparatus, mm -hmm. uh, eventually turning it, uh, turning the country into an uh, Orwellian society on steroids. And so a lot of this is technology that's coming from the West. Technology is supposed to be helping to make our lives better, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, to the Chinese government's benefit, it's making the Chinese government much more uh, secure, uh, particularly the C uh, Communist Chinese, Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping's China. So would you call Xinjiang a surveillance state? It is a trick question. It's an autonomous region, um, a state. It's surveillance state in the way that the Chinese want to make sure that people are happy, smiling, chanting, and uh, uh, renouncing, denouncing their ethnic identity, religious belief and waking up to worship to Xi Jinping instead of their um, god. Uh, so by doing that, they wanted to surveil people's, uh, monitor people's private lives, uh, in addition to installing barcodes on the doors, uh, Whoa. Uh, and randomly checking your phones, uh, making you go through iris scans. In some instances, they, the Chinese government so concerned that uh, some Uyghurs may have a bad dream at night, so they uh, send the Chinese cadres uh, to sleep in Uyghur bedrooms to make sure that they will not wake up in the middle of the night uh, afraid of the Xi Jinping's uh, regime. Oh, I can't imagine that being abused in any way. So I want to ask about the political re-education camps in Xinjiang. So at first, the Communist Party denied that they existed. Uh, now they're saying that local governments can educate and transform extremists in these vocational training centers. 
That sounds very lovely. Two thoughts. One, um, the entire world, uh, I would call civilized world, believe that the Chinese government will come out after the UN report and apologize to the Uyghur people and bring justice to those officials who committed this heinous crime. I think the, the civilized world is very disappointed that they haven't seen such a decency, uh, forgetting that authoritarian uh, dictatorship, the ones that in, in Beijing are known for uh, conflating, denying, and confusing. So, uh, so people should not be surprised that the Chinese government initially denied. So what they're doing now is to say that uh, in order to achieve their conversion, conversion pro, uh, programs, uh, basically converting the Uyghurs from who they are to something that they're not, uh, and claiming that they are providing this vocational training programs, uh, as if that those Uyghurs will be trained and sent to coastal cities to work in a uh, foreign assembly lines. Maybe the Uyghurs will be uh, making your iPhones after finishing this re-education camps. So what is life like in a re-education camp? The life uh, in re-education camps is, is exactly the way how the Chinese uh, designed it and want it to be. You spend half of your day um, with a flag, flag raising ceremony uh, singing Chinese uh, Communist Party songs and uh, phrasing Xi Jinping's ruling uh, uh, in a way that you worship uh, spiritually. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you have a very basic meal. Uh, and then in the afternoon you watch um, anti-separatist movies, videos, uh, go through indo indoctrination programs. So that's a typical uh, uh, daily routine uh, based on personal accounts by those who were detained. But the Chinese government calls it uh, re-education. Um, re-education means you get up uh, in the morning, you have nothing but to please your uh, jailers, the guys with the uh, black uniform, machine guns and helmet walking around as you've seen on the pictures in barbed wire uh, compounds. So, and then the Chinese want you to, uh, uh, despite your age, despite the environment that you grow up, despite what you appreciate in life, uh, you gradually, uh, or by force, uh, accept the Chinese way of life. The one problem um, that uh, they both government and some people in China have a, a problem with or have a difficulty to grip with is as if their preference in life, culturally, linguistically, is something universal as such the Uyghurs should accept mm -hmm. and become one of them. So us against them mentality has been very, uh, 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 us against them mentality has been in practice in Chinese society. Uh, quietly encouraged by the Chinese government-controlled state media. Well, I mean, that's sort of how the Communist Party has ruled all of China, always making certain groups the enemy class that you do have to struggle against. So why is the Communist Party targeting Uyghurs? There are three possible reasons for the Chinese government to implement uh, this um, uh, Nazi Germany-like uh, policies. Uh, some people think that we got to be careful with the terminology, uh, but if you look at the um, legal definition of cultural genocide, uh, what the Chinese government has been undertaking purposefully, systematically, uh, fits into the definition. Uh, reasonable people may disagree, but um, there's no other way of seeing what they have been doing it uh, as crimes against humanity and cultural genocide. Uh, why are they doing it? One, uh, this is all about China's global ambition. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, announced this uh, international project called One Belt, One Road Initiative that expands to uh, more than 70 countries 
of those 70 countries, seven of them have borders with Uyghur's ethnic uh, ancestral homeland, East Turkestan. So when you look at the map from the China proper all the way to Central Asia, you got to go through this big land mass, which is four times the size of California. Uh, of course, this is an unstated goal. The Chinese never admit this is part of their objectives. But uh, to some uh, Chinese uh, strategists or party leaders or some people who advise Xi Jinping, the, the area must be fully controlled. Otherwise, China's global ambition will be hampered, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, this has a lot to do with uh, Xi Jinping's ability to keep China together. Mm -hmm. So there's a thing called the domino effect. Uh, the Chinese leader uh, believed that if East Turkestan, the Uyghur's homeland, gets out of hand, it will affect negatively to other uh, China-related areas, such as Tibet, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that as long as that region, that people stays as they are, will eventually will pose political threat. And number three, uh, the th third reason uh, that some people are uncomfortable talking has a lot to do with racism. Mm. Uh, the Ch in Chinese uh, society, as well as the Chinese government's uh, way of conducting business, uh, or implementing policies oftentimes tell us that they have a lot of ra uh, racially motivated uh, uh, policies being implemented. This started with banning the Uyghur language, uh, restricting female individuals, children under the age of 12, uh, students from entering mosque. Uh, the human rights organizations, various governments were complaining about that. And now the Chinese government uh, under Xi Jinping's leadership, believe that uh, Uyghur's ethnic background uh, is, is a kind of tumor, uh, and religious belief is mental disease. So for um, uh, fair-minded people, uh, I don't think this requires any explanation. It's pretty evident. If you flip through the history books, you see a very similar mindset calling somebody's ethnicity, religion, uh, as something that needs to be eradicated. So it is inconceivable in the 21st century, in 2018, we're having this conversation about China that is uh, systematically, purposefully uh, criminalizing the entire nation because of their ethnicity and because of their religious belief. I might add that Uyghurs have been practicing Islam uh, as early as 12th, 13th century. Mm. So um, whoever is advising Xi Jinping, or it, it's unknown if it, if, if it is his idea, this policy will eventually uh, fail. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to work. It may work for a small group of people. It may create a long-lasting long uh, emotional and psychological damages to both uh, the Uyghurs, both inside and outside of China. But strategically, uh, this is not going to work. This will create more resentment and strong anti-colonial sentiment among the Uyghur people, uh, wherever you can find them. So after 9-11, the Communist Party stopped calling Uyghurs separatists and started using the term terrorist. Why? Um, the Chinese government thought um, after 9-11 that the world will be turned against Islam and there will be a war because this country was attacked. And uh, to the Chinese government, it sounds like, it seems like uh, their long-awaited opportunity just arriving. Because in, in the past, the Chinese government tried to um, justify uh, their har its harsh policies when, with respect to Uyghur's cultural and religious freedom by saying that uh, they are extremists, but Uyghurs by nature are very moderate Muslim. The word terrorism does not even exist in the Uyghur dictionary. So the Chinese government were very effective and uh, in its opportunistic uh, approach. Two weeks after 9-11, uh, Chinese party secretary for the local government 
came out and said, oh, China is also a victim of terrorism. At the same time, in the central government level, in a diplomatic effort, uh, they find an opportunity to uh, get on board uh, on intelligence sharing purposes of war on terrorism. Mm -hmm. Because if it's an uh, intimate relationship with Pakistan, and Pakistan being the, one of the uh, few countries recognized uh, Taliban regime, uh, along with Saudi Arabia and others, uh, were in a good position to um, obtain some uh, valuable intelligence and share it with the United States. So because of that opp uh, opportunity, uh, the United States were uh, kind of willing to work with the Chinese because this country was not expected that level of that magnitude of attack. Mm -hmm. so, uh, in 2009, uh, there was a turning point uh, in the modern Uyghur history. Uh, there was Uyghurs took to the streets to protest, and Chinese uh, responded with um, its uh, security, and resulting in et not only ethnic clash but uh, death and injuries that has been widely reported. And then uh, some people think that this was the uh, a wake up call for the Chinese to implement even much more aggressive policies. Thank you very much for joining us today. If people would like to learn more about you or the Uyghur cause, what, where can they go? They should uh, visit uh, three main websites. Uh, one is uhrp.org, it stands for Uyghur, Amer uh, Uyghur Human Rights Project, and also um, uh, UyghurAmerican.org, that is the website for Uyghur American Association, and also World Uyghur Congress website, UyghurCongress.org. Those are the three uh, Uyghur organizational websites, but I also encourage uh, people to read uh, the reports done by Human Rights Watch and Congressional Executive Committee on China, which just published a new report uh, a couple days ago. So there, there are uh, a wealth of information uh, available uh, publicly. Uh, so I might say that uh, the narrative, the uh, the narrative that are supported by evidentiary uh, information is overwhelming. Well, thank you again for joining us and sharing the story of the Uyghurs. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this interview, but there's actually much more to learn about the situation uh, the Uyghurs are facing inside of China. Fortunately, I had Nuri on the China Unscripted podcast. If you listen to the podcast, you will learn more about the Uyghur people, their concerns, and difficult times that they're going through under the leadership of China's uh, Superman, Xi Jinping. Ah, the Superman. I put a link below. Be sure to check it out. You won't regret it.